In this video, we are going to look at the multi-cycle CPU implementation. We will first look at the limitations of a single cycle CPU, and then look at how operations can be split across multiple clock cycles. One aspect that becomes relevant in the context of multi-cycle CPU implementations is synchronous memory, in particular, when read operations are made synchronous to the clock. We will finally look at a state machine based implementation method that can be used in order to realize such a multi cycle CPU. Let's start with this picture of what a CPU core could look like. This is from the textbook by Patterson and Hennessy. And as you can see over here, the main components are the instruction memory from where the instructions are retrieved, the register file where temporary data is stored an ALU that handles arithmetic operations, data memory that is used either for storing data or for having data which can be loaded into the registers, and finally the program counter that actually takes care of the sequencing of instructions. There is some additional circuitry such as the add adders which are used in order to increment or update the program counter, and several multiplexers and the corresponding control signals marked in blue that effectively form the control logic required for implementing the entire CPU. Let us consider some sample numbers over here. In particular, assume that a memory access, either from instruction or data memory, takes 200 picoseconds from the time that the address is made available to the corresponding block. Similarly, assume that an ALU operation takes 200 picoseconds. And either a read or a write in the register file takes 100 picoseconds. Clearly, this is a simplification because ALU operations, for example, would depend on the actual type of operation involved. However, this is just an illustrative set of numbers that we are going to use in order to show how the clock period could be determined and potential problems that arise. Because of this, we will also ignore the setup and hold time that is required for all the sequential elements in the circuit, and similarly the TCQ, the clock to queue output delay. With these sets of numbers, let's now try and understand what would be the latencies or the time required for executing various different kinds of operations. Let's first consider the load word. In this table, it is marked as load double word, but it does not really matter. All that matters is that we are accessing data from the data memory. If you recall, what happens in the case of a load word instruction is that we first need to fetch the instruction from instruction memory. And as we saw, this is going now going to take us 200 picoseconds. After fetching the instruction, we need to compute the address in the data memory from which we want to load data. That takes 100 picoseconds because we need to read values from the register file. The register file one thing to keep in mind over here is we assume that even if we need to read multiple operations from the register file, they happen in parallel and therefore the total time required to read is 100 picoseconds. In the case of the load instruction, that's not really relevant, but it could matter for R type instructions, ALU operations. Now the load instruction needs to actually compute the target address. In this case, we are marking that also as an ALU operation because in many architectures, we can just reuse the ALU in order to do the addition required for computing the target address. The assumption here is that even if we decide that we are going to use a custom adder just for computing the target address, the time required for it would be more or less the same, 200 picoseconds. So we could just call it an ALU operation and make that part of the total time required for the load operation. After this, we need to actually access the data from memory. Once the ALU operation is done, we assume that the target address is now ready and has been applied to the data memory. 200 picoseconds later, the data memory is going to give us the result. And after that, we need another 100 picoseconds to write this data back into a register. When we add up all of these values, we find that the time required for a load word instruction is going to be 800 picoseconds. What about store word? In this case, we still need to fetch the instruction, read the register value to find the target address, use the ALU to compute the target address, and access the memory, but in this case only to write data to it. 
we do not need to wait for the data to come back from memory. And in particular, we don't need to write anything back into the register file after the data access. Therefore, we save on the final register write and end up with a total time of 700 picoseconds. What about ALU type operations? In this case, once again, we need to fetch the instruction, access the values from the register file, perform the actual ALU operation, and write the result back into a register. So 600 picoseconds. Finally, for branch type operations, let's say as an example, we are going to do a branch equals. In this case, we need 200 picoseconds to fetch the instruction, 100 picoseconds to read the values from the register. An ALU operation is required with, since we, after all, are checking the equality of two register values and deciding whether to branch based on that. But that's it. The assumption here is that the actual computation of the branch target address is something that is happening in parallel with the register read and the ALU operation. We don't need to wait until the ALU operation is finished to compute the target address. Therefore, the time required for a branch operation is actually only 500 picoseconds. However, the clock period that must be used for this system must be sufficiently long so that all operations can execute, which means that in this particular case, we will need to choose a clock period greater than or equal to 800 picoseconds, which is the worst case operation, the load word operation. As you can see from this example, the ALU operations take only 600 picoseconds, but because of the load word, the ALU operations also need to operate at a clock cycle of 800 picoseconds. Similarly, of course, for the branch operations. Now, there is a good principle in engineering in general, but especially in the case of computer architecture, which is sometimes labeled, make the common case fast. And in this case, what that means is that we need to find out what kind of operations are going to be executed the most often and see whether we are unnecessarily penalizing those operations by having a long clock period corresponding to the load instruction. In other words, if we were to actually find that our programs consist of a very large number of load and perhaps store operations, then maybe this 800 picoseconds is fine. However, a typical computer program contains many more ALU operations than load and store operations and usually has just a few branches, typically some kind of loop operations in the middle. However, for a single cycle implementation, all operations are going to take equally long. And this is definitely not desirable because it means that ALU operations that could have completed within 600 picoseconds are now forced to take 800 picoseconds. What are the alternatives? Perhaps we could have split operations into multiple clock cycles. In particular, what if we decide to push the data accesses into a second clock cycle? How we are going to do this is not yet clear, but we just want to explore the possibility at least. So if we decide that we will take a clock period of 600 picoseconds, but push all data accesses into the second clock cycle, what we can see is that load and store operations will now need two clock cycles because the data access happens in the second clock cycle. You might notice that they only use 500 out of 600 picoseconds in the first clock cycle and only use either 300 or 200 picoseconds in the second clock cycle. But that doesn't really matter. We have just sort of committed saying that we have to use a clock period of 600 picoseconds. The advantage of using 600 picoseconds, of course, is that ALU operations can now finish within one clock cycle. But that clock cycle can now be 600 picoseconds rather than 800. Another alternative could be, let's try and split after the ALU operation. After all, all the different types of instructions seem to go up to there. In that case, what we'll find is that load, store, and ALU operations all require two clock cycles, but that clock cycle period is 500 picoseconds. Unfortunately, what that means is that the time actually required to complete an ALU operation is 1000 picoseconds because it is forced to take two clock cycles. Branches alone benefit in this case because they can finish within a single clock cycle. Is there another alternative? Yes, we could also decide to split after the register read, in which case what we will find is that loads and stores will actually need three clock cycles. Most likely what we would do is the instruction fetch and the register read happens in one clock cycle, 
the ALU operation happens in the second clock cycle and the data access and register write for a load word happens in the third. On the other hand, for ALU operations, we could do instruction fetch and register read in the first clock cycle and the ALU operation and the register read combined into the second clock cycle. We don't necessarily need to move the register write into the third clock cycle. What this means is that loads and stores take three clock cycles, but now that clock cycle period is 300 picoseconds. So the total time required for a load operation has gone up from the original 800 to 900 picoseconds. For store operations, it has gone up from 700 to 900. For ALU operations, it has gone down from 800 picoseconds for a single cycle down to 600 picoseconds, which is the best possible time for an ALU operation. And for branch instructions, it takes 600 instead of the ideal 500, but still it has come down from the 800 that would be required for a single cycle operation. Another place where we benefit by having multiple clock cycles is when memory accesses are synchronous. In particular, when we have the notion of something called a synchronous read. What this means is that if we give an address in clock cycle number n, the data corresponding to that address comes back from the memory only on the next clock cycle. That is to say, we have to wait until the corresponding clock edge and only then will the data be available back to us. You can see an example here. The address that has changed at this point to AA should ideally have directly read to, led to D out coming a short while later. However, what we find is the D out depends not only on the change in address, but also on this clock edge. In this case, this diagram is actually showing a situation where we also do a read after write, that is to say the write operation in case we are writing something into the data, into the same memory location, then the memory will actually take that value which is being written into the corresponding memory location and directly bypass it back to us to come out as the output. As far as the CPU implementation is concerned, this is not really an issue because typically we have only one instruction in flight. It's either a load or a store and we don't really need to worry about this read after write kind of situation. But what does happen over here is that it's telling us that our original assumption that if we can give an address, the data will come back to us immediately within the same clock cycle no longer holds. What we need to do is we give the address, wait for a clock edge and the data comes back on the next clock cycle. As far as the single cycle CPU, is implement, uh, CPU implementation is concerned, this basically means we can't do it. On the other hand, if we figure out how to implement a multi-cycle CPU, this becomes fairly straightforward. We just need to make the load operation two or three clock cycles as required by waiting for one clock cycle after giving the address so that we can get the data on the next clock cycle and then write that value into the corresponding register. So load operations, in other words, would get the instruction and access the registers in cycle number n, compute the address also in the same cycle, but then the data comes back from the memory only in cycle n plus one. And we could use the same data in order to write into the register in the same cycle n plus one itself. What about instruction memory? If we decide that instruction memories are also synchronous reads, what that effectively means is that we need to generate the target address one clock cycle in advance. This one way of doing this is to basically make all instructions a minimum of two clock cycles. What about branch instructions? We could implement this in this way. We decode and read the register values in clock cycle number n and check the branch condition in clock cycle n. In parallel, compute the branch target address. So everything about the branch basically completes in cycle n. And it's just that we need to make sure that we apply the branch in cycle n and wait for the actual instruction to come back in the next clock cycle. If we do it this way, it's possible to complete a branch also in two clock cycles, just like the other instructions. How would we go about implementing a multi-cycle CPU? 
clearly now we need to have some concept of state. In other words, the CPU needs to know where it is. Is it fetching a new instruction, completing the execution of an instruction, and how many cycles into an instruction is it at present? All of this constitutes some notion of state, that is the present state of the system, that needs to be recorded somewhere, which means that we can now think in terms of finite state machines. For example, for an ALU operation, the first state would essentially say, read the instruction, during this also get the register values, compute the program counter and apply it to the instruction memory. Now, when I say read the instruction, get the register values and so on, what I effectively mean is generate control signals that would cause the instruction to be taken from the register, the instruction register and decoded so that the RS1, RS2, RD, the register addresses would be extracted from the instruction and applied to the register. That would in turn result in getting the register values out. Similarly, we can compute the program counter, the next value of the program counter. And since it's an ALU operation, we know that that's always going to be PC plus four. Apply it to the instruction memory. Remember that if we apply the address to the instruction memory in this cycle, we will get the instruction back in the next clock cycle. So what do we do in the next clock cycle, state two? We get the ALU output. It basically means that we can now afford to take an extra clock cycle. The ALU can take more time to perform its computation. And that value can be applied to the register file so that it will get updated at the end of the register, at the end of that clock cycle. At the same time, the instruction memory would respond to the address that we have given it in state one. We will get an output from the instruction memory. And what we do is we now store that into the instruction register. All set for the next instruction to start decoding. What if the instruction was a load type of instruction? Then in state one, we could, for example, read the instruction and get the register values. In state two, get the ALU output and apply it to the data memory. And now we compute the program counter and apply it to the instruction memory. Why not compute the program counter? Because uh, in, in S1, after all, we know that it is always going to be PC plus four. The reason is because we only want the instruction, the next instruction to come one cycle before the instruction actually completes. Therefore, since we know that the load instruction in this case is going to take three clock cycles, because the data memory also requires an extra clock cycle, we will compute the PC and apply it in S2. In S3, we'll get the IMEM output because we gave the address in the previous clock cycle. And similarly, we will also get the DMEM output because we gave the address in the previous clock cycle. Both of these, the IMEM output can be stored in the instruction register and the DMEM output can be stored into the register file. Now, you'll notice that S1 and S2 could potentially also have been combined into a single state. There's nothing fundamentally preventing us from doing that. What this means is that we get a lot of flexibility in terms of what operations we put into which state and how we control the overall evolution of the system. Finally, what about branch instructions? Here again, we would read the instruction, get the register values, and we could compute the PC plus four as one possible input of the MUX. That is the case where the branch is not taken. In state two, we could compute the branch out target and in parallel compute whether or not the branch is to be taken. That is the ALU output. Now, of course, this branch target could also have been computed in S1. Similarly, we could also have chosen to collapse S1 and S2 into a single clock cycle, single state. But the important point is we need to compute the target address one cycle before the instruction memory gives its output which means that we need at least these two clock cycles in order to get the instru next instruction out. And once we get it, we can store it into an instruction register and prepare to go back and once again evaluate the states as for any other instruction. In this way, you can see that the implementation of a multi-cycle CPU could be done by essentially implementing some kind of a finite state machine whose behavior is dependent on the type of instruction. The number of states required is probably not very large. You would just need to have a different state for each 
type of instruction rather than for each individual instruction in the IAC. 